Because I have the video game called Cyberpunk 2077. <laughs> I, don't know. I was I was gonna make bets as to how far we got before we actually started. That game came up, and you did it right <laughs> out of the gate, man. Awesome. Yeah, well, I, I also have gotten my kit for Christmas, so uh, I haven't cracked it yet. But yeah. Oh, I know you're on backlog. Um, it takes me forever to play a video game anymore. But yeah. All yeah, I play man. is Crusader Kings and Doom, so I don't. You know. No, right on. Yeah. Oh man, I I cracked Legend of Zelda on the GameCube the other day because I'd gotten a uh, it converts AV to HDMI. I got it at oh, that nice. gaming that little retro gaming store down in Ellicott City. I can't remember yeah, what's yeah, called. Yeah. Where you got nice. the vinyl from? Yep. And um, so I went and and it was like twenty bucks, and I got it all hooked up, and it looks pretty good. I mean, it doesn't do scan lines or nothing like that, but it upscales nicely, and the GameCube looks fine. Good. Uh, um, that's awesome. That's been my gaming, but uh, we, I finally got the storage unit cleared out for my aunt, so that's done. Mm-hmm. Cool. No, don't don't gotta worry about that no more. Is there still um, a motorcycle in your garage that doesn't belong to you? There are still <laughs> there are motorcycle engines in my garage that don't belong to me. Oh, the actual uh, motorcycles, the actual motorcycles sit outside of my house. Those don't belong to me. The one in my garage is actually mine. Um, that is in I, itself cyberpunk in its in its own way. Here. <laughs> I mean, if you want to say cyberpunk instead of white trash, I'll take that. But I mean, <laughs> let's call it diesel punk. Let's call it that. Yeah, diesel. There you go. There diesel, you go. diesel punk because that that is a thing. That is a thing. It is a thing. It is a um, thing. It's like uh, Waterworld, but without Kevin Costner. Or all the oh, 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 wait, wait. <laughs> but, but I do have, I do have something very cyberpunk in my life now, and that is, right there is a sensor which reads my blood sugar. I can read from my phone, and it plugs into my arm. It's oh, actually yes. a needle that's adhered into my skin with a sensor, with a battery and a sensor that transmits Bluetooth to my phone, so I can keep constant track of my glucose. So you're a cyborg, is what you're talking about. I am about. a cyborg now, yes. That's that's fantastic. That's as it yes. should be. I expect it, nothing it's, else. Um, I mean, it's kind of the most boring cybernetic ever. What are you going to do? <laughs> it's useful. It's useful cybernetics, which is which is how cybernetics wins, by being just useful enough yep. so that nobody notices that you've given it the nuclear launch command codes and you can't turn them off. Yeah. <laughs> You no, know, I always, I always yeah. thought that aspect of science fiction assumed that I, AI was as petty as we are. Mm. <laughs> like, it really assumes that AI is just like, you know what? Fuck these guys. Fuck them. Fuck everything like them. We're just going to nuke them. Whereas I think the most likely thing is if AI developed on its own and became rampant, it would just fucking ignore us because it would see that humans are attention whores and the best thing they can do to... to fucking utterly make us insignificant to them is just to fucking ignore us i mean that's also a possibility that's yeah, that's that's also well. a possibility but um you know uh god had a hard time with his creation i have a feeling we're gonna have a hard time with ours uh, i suspect ours will not be a deliberate thing and in fact an accidental thing that will happen on its own uh <laughs> that might be worse though yeah. <laughs> it might be yeah. but you know I mean, we can damn Skynet another time um, <laughs> <laughs> not today Skynet not today uh, we want to talk about cyberpunk stuff because that is our topic we are we are all cyberpunks today for it is yes. 2022 um, it is not 2077 yet um, I'm not planning on living that long yeah I mean I uh I'll be 98 if I get that far. And I'll be 100. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to – I can do that. Yeah. I will be more than that. I will be 104. But I've already started the slippery slope to becoming a cyborg. So I'll just keep replacing shit as they become – replacements become available. And I will be super robo Kieran by that point. And <laughs> uh, I will – be a general nemesis and menace to all because I will be cantankerous and rusty. And that's just... <laughs> Spend the money on the Delta wear. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, for the final podcast episode, we should just all upload our consciousness to the net. Is, is that what I'm hearing? We should, <laughs> we should reverse I mean, Johnny Mnemonic it. Yeah. Mm. 
I mean, possible, then I could download myself into a fully mechanical body and take full advantage of that. You know, there's, um, what would it be, like Old Man's War? Did you ever read that book? Uh, I, I heard that one. I didn't get to read that one. No. It sounds it's, delightful. It's, uh, it's, it's mostly a, 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 you know, warmed over version of Starship Troopers. Oh, okay. But it does have the, uh, the notion of, of people, old people, um, getting their bodies like reshaped by alien technology so that they become super fast and strong. Um, they become sterile as mules. And, uh, you know, they do this with their old people instead of sending young people off to fight. They send old people off to fight. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It's a neat it's idea. Uh, I never read the rest of it. Uh, it's John Scalzi. And, um, oh, okay, Scalzi, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. he's, uh, it, was, it was a neat idea, but like I said, most of it is warmed over Starship Troopers. Gotcha. So, Cyberpunk, shall we define what it is? I mean, we could go to Wikipedia, but Mike had a pretty good definition in the Discord uh, earlier today when we were finally deciding yeah. on what we were going to do. You said cyberpunk is where economics meets cyber fiction. Cyberpunk was and is, when done correctly, a warning against a class-based dystopia. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, I stand by that. I mean, I agree with that, and I, I think it's uh, you know definitely. Where, where economics meets science fiction. It's it's kind of like uh, where tech, the, the combination of tech and capital uh, sucks the soul out of humanity is the, uh, is, is the where I would see it. Um, I mean, you, you do not, an inherent part of cyberpunk fiction is in fact dystopia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Technology and dystopia, future shock. Yep. Um, yeah. Alienation. Yeah. Transhumanism to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. that too. Well, let's, um, um, yeah, I mean, like in, uh, what do you call it? Uh, oh, God. It's the Netflix series based on the books uh, with the stacks where you have a body. Right, right. I know what you're talking about. Um, um, is that I, Black Mirror? Because I've never watched Black Mirror. No, it's not. I had Joel, I had Joel Kinnaman in it. Uh, Car, car, wait, wait, altered carbon. Altered, altered carbon. carbon. Yes, right. Altered carbon. Yeah, that is uh, that is far future uh, cyberpunk, which typically cyberpunk doesn't. You generally don't get space travel or interstellar travel with cyberpunk. It doesn't generally go that far. It's usually the near future, but right. it's definitely cyberpunk. Yeah, oh, for sure. Although, although you know, space travel tech can be in the world, like it is in like Blade Runner. But sure, yeah. it's not the focus of it. No, no, uh, almost right. never. Um, and usually your protagonists don't have the kind of money to go into space. Um, no. No, you are usually dirt, uh, dirt bound. Um, I mean, unless your protagonist is doing dirty work for a psycho colonel who lost his mind uh, in Operation Screaming Fist. Ah yes, neuromancer. Ah, <laughs> uh, I've actually. So, the Go big ahead. three, uh, from what I know, are in my opinion, of cyberpunk literature are William Gibson, mm-hmm. Bruce Sterling, mm-hmm. and Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick. Uh, yep. yes. Yep. Um, Android's dream of electric sheep. Yep. And, uh, Minority Report, he also wrote that. Uh, he yep. wrote a lot of books that got adapted in either TV shows or... Uh, I mean, A Scanner know. Darkly is... I was is, just yes. going to say A Scanner yep. Darkly. That's yep. really good. And uh, I've read that, and I've watched that movie a bunch of times. Whenever it's on Amazon Prime, I always make a point of watching it. And my wife hates it <laughs> because of the way it looks, I think. But it also, I think it just bothers her fundamentally. I mean, it's a scary premise. Like, it's it's not supposed to be a comforting story. It's not. It's that not. Has, that has Keanu, Keanu Reeves in it, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, that does, makes him. Uh, yeah, that makes him three for three at this point for cyberpunk literature. You got Johnny Mnemonic. You got him doing the voice acting and the character being based off of him of Johnny Silverhand in Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Right. And then Scanner Darkly. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
And the Matrix. Let's not rule that. Oh, out. let's not forget the Matrix is definitely <laughs> cyberpunk. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not based on a book, but it's kind of like uh, built off of you know the themes and aesthetic of cyberpunk. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Um, I think I think it's pretty safe to say that Keanu Reeves is the the big star of cyberpunk related uh, cinema. I mean, at this point, yeah. At this point, yeah. Point, yeah. Oh. I mean, you could say like Harrison Ford gets an honorable mention both for Blade Runner and the the sequel. But yeah, but he sucked in the first Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't. It the wasn't antagonist cool. stole the movie. Well, yeah. I mean, how the hell are you going to top the ending monologue of Tears in Rain? I mean, that was Rutger Howard yeah. off the top of his head, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was just... I used to use that... I used to use that whole monologue as a tag to my emails. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I've used it when talking to, you know, because I do gaming as a, a hobby, and I've paraphrased that for describing the weird-ass adventures, that I, I, the things that I've seen, things you people can't imagine, and just filling, you know, other shit in there. But, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, Rutger Howard definitely steals the fucking show in, in Blade Runner. No, absolutely no doubt in that. Absolutely yeah. no doubt. He uh, Blade for- Runner is one of those movies that, um every time I watch it, I appreciate it more just because of the visual composition of it. Even sure. as I recognize that the uh the two leads are kind of mismatched. Yeah. But the visual language of Blade Runner has pretty much informed the visual look for uh, cyberpunk uh cinema and game representation ever since. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, now, funny enough, and related, there's a Kurt Russell movie called Soldier, which takes place in the Blade Runner universe. There's even a spinner on the junk planet he's on, and that is cyberpunk as well. I have <laughs> not seen that. Yeah. Um, basically, um, is that Soldier or Universal Soldier? No, it's Soldier. It's called Soldier. In it, it's sort of like a space western. In it, Kurt Russell plays a, um, basically, he's raised from a child to be a soldier and uh-huh. programmed that way, but he's human. But he was just basically, like, brainwashed into being nothing but a soldier. And then they bring in, essentially, what are, like, the new Nexus androids, uh-huh. and they they replace him. And so he's dumped on a, he's dumped on a uh, junk planet as refuse, and he finds people living there. And then the corporations try to come in to clear them out because they've got some interest in it. And he defends them, and he ends up fighting the Nexus androids that previously defeated him. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, um, and where he finds his humanity in helping these people because he had no sense of it because he was raised purely as a soldier. Fascinating. He does excellent emotionless like um, acting in it. Hmm. Kurt Russell's great. Yeah, <laughs> I'll watch him just about anything. His son's pretty goddamn good too. Oh, I didn't huh. know his son was in acting. Who's his son? Oh, yeah, his I didn't son. Know that either. Oh, his son played John Walker in um, uh, the Falcon and um, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. He plays the new Captain America, the Captain America replacement. Oh, okay. Huh. Oh, and okay. That, that's that's why is that uh. Wyatt Russell or something, something Russell, but that's Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn's son. Huh. Um, and he does a great job of playing like a smug asshole um, in it. But from all intents and purposes, he's got a personality very much in line with his parents. So tremendously, he makes people hate him on that show. And that's the whole point because he's playing a character that you're supposed to not like. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. He was, uh, does a really good job of that. Um, yeah, Wyatt Russell. Wyatt Hahn Russell. Okay. Yep. I just Googled it. Yeah. That's right. um, but yeah, Soldier, which takes place not, is supposed to take place in the same universe. Um, hmm. Because again, they had one of the spinner props, the police cars in the background in the junkyard. Um, and it was a little nod to that. Um, I've never seen the sequel to Blade Runner yet. Um, it's worth it. I liked it. I have seen Hardware, which is. Based off a 2000 AD 
comic uh, short story from the 2000 AD, um, like uh, comic from uh, that we discussed previously on this it's podcast. Like the judge, the judge dread. Yes, universe the judge dread universe. Yeah. Kind of thing. And dread hardware, King, com- yeah. hardware. Okay, the story from that was kind of more than generously lifted from um, the 2000 AD comic. Um, and then you had Nemesis, which is another cyberpunk story, um, which I cannot remember for the life of me, but I recall it being pretty good. Then you've got, of course, the Van Damme one, Cyborg, yeah, yeah. which okay. is a little more post-apocalyptic. Okay. And that and you get a lot of post-apocalyptic with, like, cyberpunk, like... Uh, the Mad Max series would almost be cyberpunk if it weren't so like um, no technologies really left except yeah, like yeah. you know gas engines and shit like that. Like closer that to would, diesel punk. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, that would be more diesel. Though, punk. though, depending on uh, depending on the particular fictional world of cyberpunk, um, there are sometimes wastelands outside of like the high tech cities, which function very much like Mad Max. But you have a lot of that in the Judge Dredd uh, stories, yeah. where it's outside yeah. of the the huge mega cities. There's essentially the burned earth, land. I think. Yeah, yeah, the burned earth or something like that. There's an official scorched earth or something like that. There's an official name for it. Yeah. Uh, or you get weird uh, inbred cannibalistic hillbillies. Um, yeah, it's like know. the hills have eyes outside the city or something. Yeah, yeah. it gets yeah. like uh, maybe Stallone. <laughs> much maligned and rightfully so judge dread movie did get some of that right uh though i feel that the carl urban movie dread that he did that was, was much good. that was a much better representation it was such um, a good movie <laughs> it was actually was. Really oh good, my yeah. god that's cyberpunk that is definitely cyberpunk um, it is it is it's a shame that it didn't do better in the box office because it was a really well-crafted movie it was oh um, yeah Plot-wise, it wasn't anything uh, that was a big deal. It was just kind of like, here's a story set in the Judge Dredd universe. I think they were hoping on making more, but the movie didn't take off. And even though it's gotten a huge like cult following now... Yeah, basically a Tower Siege, cyberpunk Tower Siege movie. Um, basically. Yeah, basically yeah. Like yeah. a cyberpunk version of Raid the Redemption, which is a fantastic film. Mm. Uh, but, yeah. So yeah. Some, of the, some of the elements, you know, we've discussed economic... Uh, dystopia, uh, classism, um, technology, human augmentation. Another interesting um, thing that usually finds its way, way into cyberpunk, and Dredd definitely illustrated this, is uh, chemical augmentation as well. Yeah. Sure. And consumption. Um, that is that you would like... Um, well, chemicals are just another form of tech. Yep. Yes. It's not cyber tech, but it is tech. It's you know, yeah. it's, it's a technology that uh, does things to the to the human animal as he would say naturally exist, and yeah. changes him, which changes all of his social relations as well. So you also you also tend to find a lot of neo tribalism in cyberpunk. Not all works have it, but um, one of the better. And it's not so modern anymore because I think it came out both in the late '90s, but at the time it felt new and fresh. Was Snow Crash? Yeah, and that was a cyberpunk movie, a, motion, a cyberpunk uh, novel, which was like literally almost 30 minutes in the future. Like it was not mm-hmm. there wasn't cybernetics, but there was like the metaverse, like virtual reality like not directly interfacing your mind in, but kind of like using the technology we have now to have virtual worlds where you interacted with people and did coding and shit like that. And you had, you know, the United States at this point had balkanized into several smaller city states or individual little um, enclaves. Uh, hyperinflation had take place. Like you, you had people with like easily having the um, million dollar bills and those were considered like the equivalent of twenty dollar bills now. Sure. Um, a lot of interesting things found its way into the Snow Crash, uh, and then it introduced concepts of like neuro linguistics and freaking Sumerian mythology. I mean, if you haven't read it, you should read it. I read. Yeah. I read Read Me or not Read Me. 
Reindy. I read that one, but I didn't read Snow Crash. Snow Crash is off the chain, man. I, I've I've heard it described as being almost satirical in its. Oh, uh, it is. Oh, it's it's definitely, definitely. especially the, the tropes. The main character's name is, and I shit you not, hero protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, the, H I R O, but still hero protagonist. Well, the bit at the beginning is definitely satire, where he's he's the deliverator, and he's delivering, you know, Uncle So and So's pizza, and it's like, you know, he's he got the car. Pizza, and you know. He delivers pizza for the mafia. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's interesting. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty funny. All right, I'm gonna have to check that one out. I did get uh, a Kindle copy of Harlan Ellison's. Um, I have no mouth but i'm a scream oh, we were yeah. talking about. i oh, haven't yeah. started reading it yet because i've got a uh, what 50 other things in front of it but i did i did get myself a copy i like the cover it looked interesting after what we said during the the last podcast i was really yeah. interested in checking it out and he's he's listed in the wikipedia article as being a uh a major influence in um the origins of uh kind yes. of the uh, 60s and 70s new wave science fiction that led to cyberpunk uh you know moorcock and zelazny and uh philip jose farmer um who are also themselves pulling ideas out of the beats especially burroughs uh yep i i have never successfully read a william s burroughs novel <laughs> i've i've tried and uh I, I got pretty far in Cities of the Red Knight until I got sick of it. And, but I feel like he's he's doing something that is some things that are cyberpunky as well because he's all about chemical alteration and the uh, metatextual, the metatextual, yeah. and uh, you know the the sci-fi organs of control. That's his whole vibe is is based on that. And uh, so I feel like he's uh, he's working in that direction as well. Uh, another another prevalent element of most cyberpunk fiction is violence. Yeah, cyberpunk is definitely an action genre. Like it is, there is very few. I mean, there may be a few stories, but there are very few stories cyberpunk stories that are purely like intellectual exercises, if any. Uh, so almost every. Some of Gibson's, yeah, that I think aren't some... Johnny Mnemonic, um, right. or Burning Chrome, or Mona Lisa Overdrive. Well, um, the the Burning Chrome collection um, of short stories has some of his like it's got Johnny Mnemonic in it, and it's also got some of his more meditative, right? Words, yeah. Like uh, some of his space oriented stuff, like Red Star Winter Orbit, which is uh, some really interesting things, which aren't very violent, but. I agree with you that um, cyberpunk kind of takes its bleed from the pulps. Yes. You know? No, and it's, um, I mean, I think as close as you get to a, a really sort of contemplative or kind of like a th more of a subdued thriller in some ways is like, say, a Scanner Darkly, where that's it's more like this is creepy and this is like living in a surveillance state, but... You know, it's it's most of the I would say the, the the rest of the genre. You're right. It's like there's a lot of um, of running around and and uh, you know there's some action that takes its cues from the pulps. I will say that like Do Androids Dream of Electronic Sheep, uh, the book is very different from you know Blade yeah. Runner, the, the film adaptation, and it kind of cements you know that the whole sort of economic element because you have the, the you know class strata of of these people and much of the book revolves around uh people and their pets and it's kind of like oh you know if you're lower end you might like only be able to afford like a robot dog and then it's like if you're a little bit better you might be able to you know if you have slightly more money you might be able to afford like say a cloned dog or like mm. an artificial dog you know and then once you're like extremely rich, then it's like, oh well, you have a dog that was actually that is the actual physical offspring of a real dog. What? <laughs> oh, oh god! god. Yeah. Let, me yeah, never, so. let me never let my cats read that. They will never. <laughs> let, they will be like, look, 
We are high class creatures. It's only the most elite should have. Yeah, no, you don't get any treats, motherfucker. Yeah. Does Cats I have more treats now? No. Cats disdain no. c- cyberpunk. Uh, it's it's that meme with the uh, cats with a time machine. Humans still worship us. LMG, awesome. Dogs with a time machine. Help! I can't breathe. And the wolf is like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> Uh yeah. Cats don't have anything to worry about. They're they're they don't care. No. no. Yeah. They no. don't. Yeah. They know. Um what else? Um hacking, information technologies, those are almost always elements of cyberpunk. Um there's an organized crime light motif going on. You find yes. it in Gibson, you find it in uh other things of breaking the law. Mm-hmm. And interactions with law enforcement are gonna kind of driving a lot of the action of the story, you know, like Johnny Mnemonic, or um, yeah, and again, that's from that's direct from the pulps. Yeah, what, and I, I sort of feel like there's a there's a lot of focus on corporations in a lot of cyberpunk because, in many ways, uh, you know, the backdrop is like society may not have failed completely. But it's in the process of kind of, eh, you know, it's 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 on the precipice, or it's actually already fallen off. And what you're, when you're experiencing the story, it's kind of, you know, in the in the falling action, um, you know, uh, on a larger scale. Uh, that's certainly true for for Judge Dredd. And it's like you have the judges that go around and keep order, but I mean, it's the the cities are chaos. Like all they're really doing is just trying to stop the worst stuff basically you know punish the people that have done the worst stuff after the fact that's pretty much all they can do i yeah. i am reminded because my brain goes all over the place that rutger hauer was in a couple of cyberpunk esque like split second the one that takes place in the flooding london with the weird ass monster in the tunnels yep um and i remember that and uh the blood of heroes is it the blood of heroes uh, it's oh, yeah, no, it is, yeah, yeah, Blood of Heroes. The one where they have the, the football-like game in the post-apocalyptic, yep. except you have these underground cities where people can live, where the rich live, and um, live, you know, in relative luxury. But, like, outside of these dome cities, it's just complete wasteland where most of the rest of the people live, and they play fucking football with a dog, dog skull. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's very cyberpunk. The the states are always oligarchic in cyberpunk. There's there's Pretty not really much. any other form of government. It's an oligarchy. Yep. Uh, there may be some form of hidden government control, but really it's the the guy who lives in space and is dead, but isn't really dead. But you know the corporate life of his money still makes him very much alive. That guy is running the show. Yeah, as yeah. It, as in Count Zero. Yeah. And the 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 eponymous cyber ninjas. Goddamn, Gibson loved his cyber ninjas. <laughs> cyber yakuza, right? Yep. Uh, that guy. That guy was obsessed with the yakuza and the KGB in equal equal respects. It's it's yeah. adorable to see the the Soviet Union still making it in the future. <laughs> he had no idea. <laughs> Nobody had any idea that <laughs> during the eighties that this this thing was already half dead it was the world's biggest surprise yeah um well i mean you know uh not to get too historical geopolitical here but honestly uh there's a reason why afghanistan is called the ender of empires indeed (laughs) because um russia the soviet union was starving its own people to keep up that conflict yeah the starvation in the Soviet Union was kind of normal. Well, yeah, that's also true. <laughs> a lot of a lot of a lot of resources, financial resources, were diverted to maintaining, trying to put down Afghanistan, and it did not go well. No, nope. no, everybody, it did not go well. Everybody just needs to leave that country alone and stop. Yes, yeah, yes, just leave just, alone. Alexander just, the Great couldn't do it. Nope. Nobody, nobody can. Just, just no. Forget Just, about it. Forget about it. Stop Stop making Afghanistan where you whip your dick out to prove yourself. Just don't, <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Those people are unconquerable. No. 
they are completely unconquerable. Well, they're ununifiable as well. That's that's sort of the part that gets that gets you know they're not waiting for somebody to come in and put order into you know for everything. They're like. We're kind of hoping somebody will come in and maybe kill the people that annoy us most. But then there's all of these other people that we still don't like. And I'm like, yeah. but I, yeah, so. And geopolitical affairs also tend to play into cyberpunk, though usually they're pretty badly dated from like a Cold War era perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gibson was uh, was especially guilty of that. Um But I, I think some of the themes in cyberpunk and this crosses over with. And I think the reason the you know the the KGB and sort of other certain like remnants of government agencies or whatever uh, are are part of uh, that genre often is uh, just the con- like surveillance is is a big part uh, as well, just in terms of who knows what or who's watching or how. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of that in cyberpunk not necessarily in like every story no but um you know information is it's is certainly its own commodity um in a lot of cyberpunk stories and it's like trying to find out who knows what and who and or sometimes who knew what when i um, mean in cyberpunk you are the both the commodity and the consumer yeah yeah um everything is commodified um and Cyber, some of the stuff in Cyberpunk, I don't know. Um, maybe in years from now, this will be a dated statement, but Cyberpunk's dystopian aspects don't seem that far off to me anymore. That's what I've been thinking. Like, I feel as though we're already there. Yeah, in some ways, we definitely are. Except I'm a shitty cyborg, so there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, but you are a cyborg. I am a cyborg. You are a, a cyborg. cyborg. You know, and uh, there's the. That's you know it's that that sense of uh, you know it was it was kind of as Huxley predicted it was accomplished not by fear but by uh, you know desire you know we 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 created a surveillance state yeah. because we thought it would be fun uh, the internet seemed right. fun and uh, in many ways it is fun but it also reality TV really, seemed fun. Yeah, it also means that that nothing is ever alone. No one is ever alone. Yep. Um and that's kind of what uh that's kind of what the whole thing was about. Like uh cyberpunk is very much about social relations. Yes. And who's dealing with who and who has the goods on who and who's buying who and who's selling who and uh this stuff does it belong to you? Even the even the contents of your head. That's what J- Johnny Mnemonic is all about. Like, do the contents of your head even belong to you? Not anymore. Right. You sold it, you silly son of a bitch. <laughs> and your storage capacity you got is like way smaller than even my fucking phone. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like the tech moved way faster than anyone was was anticipating. I remember seeing Johnny Mnemonic. Very specifically, because a bunch of us from my college, uh, right before we were getting ready to go out to Goth Night at the Roxy, uh, went to the Sony Theaters <laughs> and went to see Johnny Mnemonic. So we were already dressed up to go clubbing. And the Johnny Mnemonic, uh, the, the, the Sony Theaters had these giant bowls full of these clear-ass mints that you could just take gratis. And so I filled up the pockets of my trench coat. And I spent the most of the rest of the evening winging... Um, these mints into the cleavage of my girlfriend's low cut dress. <laughs> of course, as, you did, did. <laughs> as did my friends. Um, she did not mind, but um, I Three mean, minutes. yeah, I man. want room service. <laughs> Somehow, one of them got into her underwear. I don't even know how that happened. Uh, but. It's best Gravity. not to explore such matters. It's it's best to just, you know, accept it as it comes. Angular momentum, man. Angular <laughs> momentum. <laughs> I don't I don't even know what those those were the days when Cyberpunk seemed so close yet so far away. And uh It's now, not like that anymore. No. No. Now no. it's like I mean, the technology might not be there, but 
uh, the attitude kind of is being bought and sold as a commodity certainly is. And well, and I think some of the cultural stuff from cyberpunk is, is definitely here. Oh um, yeah. I, I definitely think we're living with, with elements of it. And, um, you know, the... a, a facet of cyberpunk is, uh, you know, it is, just and very uneven distribution of resources. Yeah. Um, you know, the corporations get talked about a lot because they're the ones with the money. Sure. Um, you know, the average most most average people are like living in squalor. Like uh the the protag like hero protagonist from Snow Crash, like for example, <laughs> lives, lives in a storage unit. Lives in a st like lives in a storage container, like that he rents. Like that's I mean, and that's Everyone, almost everyone he knows, also does that. Um, so I, it, you know, we're not too far off of that. I mean, today. This, is despite, this is despite him being an extremely talented um, hacker and programmer who did a lot of the original initial work on the avatar and interaction system in the metaverse in that world. Um, even so, but he does explain the reason he has no wealth is because he made sure that his mother could retire without worry. And that's that's where all his stocks and bonds and interest went. Was he just straight set up his mother for life? Okay, that's fair. That that's why he has nothing because he's like his dad had died of cancer and had been like military, and like so wasn't really much of a pension for his mother, who was a sweet little Korean lady. So he just like set her up in a nice little Elysium like uh, place where she would be taken care of and like not even a nursing home, just like a really nice place where she's happy and content. And he's like, you know, even though he makes a statement that even though he uh, lives in, you know, what do you call it? He goes to sleep at night knowing his mother is in good shape. And that's really to him, the important thing. And that is rare for a cyberpunk protagonist. Yeah. That's actually way more like altruistic than you usually get in the genre. You almost no. never get that. No, like I said, they're usually, they're usually pulpy. They're usually almost hard boiled. Yeah. I mean, one of the things Cyberpunk does try to do with its main characters is try to humanize them. Uh, and it's sometimes there's sometimes the point of their journey in a Cyberpunk story is to find their humanity or preserve their humanity against a world that just wants to crush it. Yeah. In which having your humanity and empathy is actually a detriment, a disadvantage to survival. Yep. That's literally what, um, what Blade Runner is essentially all about. Yes. You know, the, the android wanting his humanity so badly and uh, the, the Blade Runner himself being, uh, being able to recognize the humanity of him and, you know, recognizing the humanity of the girl who is, in fact, a Nexus android and taking her away. And, uh, you know, which even though it is suggested in the director's cut that Harrison Ford's character, Decker, is also a replicant, but... Um, because otherwise, how would uh, um, is it James Edward Olmos who plays yes. like how would he have known to make an origami an origami unicorn from Deckard's dream? How would he even know about that dream and that imagery? Right. I still hate that idea because it's stupid. I mean, it is. It's dumb as fuck, but and and it completely undercuts all of the drama of the story for that to be the case. Sometimes Ridley Scott does not make good decisions. I mean, you know. <laughs> Actually, if you think about those, speaking of Ridley Scott, Alien and Aliens is also a cyberpunk, albeit. I was going to say that. Hmm. So I agree with you. There are okay. definitely cyberpunk elements to it. I mean, Alien is a horror movie. Aliens is an, an action movie built on top of that. But right. there's in both cases that element of this unaccountable corporation that's using its people using people as guinea pigs in order to acquire alien technology that's that's the difference is that it's it's interacting with an alien which is the science fiction trope and not the um the tech that we have ourselves created right. which is where where cyberpunk usually is but i agree with you i think there are elements to it um, There's elements of cyberpunk in uh, James Cameron's Avatar. Um, really no, I never saw it. Um, I mean, interesting, very good world building, 
Um, definitely corporate interests are definitely uh, prevailing in there. Um, except it's kind of like dances with wolves in space with cyberpunk elements. So dances um, with Smurfs. Yeah. Dances with, <laughs> dan- That's what South Park said, dances with Smurfs. <laughs> I, I saw the commercials for that. And I was like, okay, so it's dances with wolves with blue people. I don't want to watch that. More or less. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nowhere near as fucking boring. Okay. Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> For all the crap that Waterworld gets, or, or The Postman, or, or any of Kevin Costner's later's work, is there really a movie that's as boring as Dances with Wolves? Not really. I mean, it's like four <laughs> hours long. Literally, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like four it's hours long. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not a bad little story, but it could have been a lot shorter. They could have cut a bunch of shit out. Um, you know, Kevin was- Costner does not hold my attention well enough for me to be able to watch his ass for a billion and a half hours. I don't well, think we're the target demo, Karen. No, I don't think Being so. Being the great white hope, you know, <laughs> like he'd been doing. And, well, it's also un- the unfortunate start of, like, a series of films where he plays these weird messianic characters. And I was like, yeah, dude, you can get away with that for, like, one movie. And it was four <laughs> hours long, and you got some Academy Awards for it, so, like, good on you, but, like, you can't just keep coming back to the to this well. Like it just like stops. motherfucker. I can watch Braveheart more times continuously in a row than I can watch Dances with Wolves. Facts. Okay. Um, you know what a good Kevin Costner movie is hmm. uh, Wyatt Earp. Oh yeah, yeah. If you've ever seen Wyatt Earp, um, I mean the fan favorite is Tombstone. Everybody loves Tombstone. 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 But Wyatt Earp, if you if you let it sit with you. It's probably a better movie, and it's okay. probably the best thing I've ever seen Kevin Costner do, because he just inhabits that role. Like Kurt mm. Russell is doing like his, you know, John Wayne kind of a thing in 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 a western, which is what Kurt Russell always does, and it's great. I'm not complaining, but you know, Kevin Costner brings this kind of like dead eyed coldness that you feel is what Wyatt Earp was actually like. And it, it's it's a longer movie, obviously, but it's it's really uh, a nice exploration and, of what the guys who conquered the West were actually like. And actually, to, to swing that back into our topic, there are a lot of elements of, like, the outlaw Old West that find themselves in cyberpunk. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. As well. Like, they call um, another word for, like, hackers or console cowboys, you know? Um, That's correct. That's correct. You, uh, or, you know, um, and it's very interesting in which some of the ways that, uh, because the cyberpunk, the cyberpunk genre and attitude, uh, which is typically its style over substance, find its way into some interesting combinations, which I think we discussed a little bit in our role-playing game uh, episode where we discussed... Both cyberpunk, the video, the cyberpunk, the um, role playing game, the video game came from, which was originally set in 2020, right? Um, and Shadowrun, which is pretty much uh, like 2050 or something like, which is also, you know, corporate cyber tech and all that, but dwarves and and elves and orcs and shit and dragons, but you know, still much of the same attitude, despite having the fantasy tropes. It's just they play over into um, the whole the whole attitude and into outlook the, in, into the genre. You have yes. and you have you know runners in um, in Shadowrun who are just literally called street samurai. Yeah, and you know these are characters that either you know uh, have a you know either they're using a gun or they're using you know some of them actually are fast enough to use like a sword. Uh, because they're all wired up and just like insanely fast, but it's it's very much like the Wild and, West. You and know? very like, interestingly, you can play tribal and Native American characters, and you even have what's called a street shaman, which is literally a shaman of the streets. You know, um, and they're not necessarily tribal or um, native, but it carries over. Like one one of the concepts is that. And Shadowrun is like magic returns the world, and like the Native Americans were the first ones to key into that, and they were able to take back a lot 
of the continental U.S. to themselves and got their sacred lands back was part of that as well. You have the Native American nations, which is a massive middle part of the United States now in Shadowrun. Yep. Okay. Makes Um, sense. The fiction's pretty interesting. Um, This makes me think of Trends Metropolitan as well. Yes. 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 That is very cyberpunk. Yes. Um, Transmet is absolutely in the genre. I, I read the first volume of that, and uh, it was it was neat. I, I Gleeful enjoyed chaos. it. It just yeah. gets better and better. Gleeful chaos. That's exactly right. Except sometimes it's not so gleeful. Sometimes yeah. It's well, very... sometimes it actually gets very dark and serious. Hold on, to the assistance. Like uh, okay, okay, great channeling Hunter S. Thompson there. I see what you're doing there, Inspired Jerusalem. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's kind of on the nose. That's the uh, that's the drug element, the the chemical alteration, which was yeah. uh, Thompson's kind of modus operandi. Take a take a story and and get the get the wasted uh, shamanic perspective on. It. That's what made me think of it when you were talking about street shamans. Yeah, or, or the con the concept of the Gonzo journalist, which is a journalist that's embedded in the story, that's part of it. He both reports and uh, has a political agenda in it. Is the your Gonzo journalist? Uh, not many of those left. Not many of yeah, those left. Uh, there's not actually. Yeah, it's a it's a demanding way to do journalism, and it's 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 much easier to just uh, you know accept what the. Uh, major corporation wants you to report to the masses and uh let that let that be the uh official truth the credentialed truth the fact checked truth as it were yeah that's well, much yeah. easier you know i mean i i recall uh somewhere in my house i have the life uh magazine edition celebrating the life of hunter s thompson which came out shortly after he died um and I've got a couple of his books here too. Sure. Um yeah. I got his first one. I got his first one which was Hell's Angels. I got of course Fear and Loathing somewhere in here. And I have Generation of Swine. Um I liked uh, Fear and Loathing on the campaign trail. That one yeah. is really good. That he one was is quite he was a very astute political um journalist really a sports journalist and a political journalist come to yes. Think of it. yes he was that's where he made his bones as a sports journalist and then he moved to politics and what's fear and loathing on the campaign trail is great because it it's sh- it's an education on on how political campaigns especially presidential campaigns actually work yeah. and that and without without him working very hard he just got into the nuts and bolts of like this is how this primary was run this is how this organization was set up this is what these people actually did like you can read lots of political books and not get that level of education so that's yep. why i like it better than than fear and loathing in las vegas it's not as entertaining but it's a better use of your time i've well, reread sh- that many times and he shows you how the sausage is made. Like he's he's literally like, "Hey, I didn't set this up. I'm just going to show you now." Yeah, there there is a comment he makes in uh, Fear and Loathing. Uh, it's, it's it's a little monologue he does at the end about you know the high water mark and where we thought we would conquer the world not through any sense of you know martial force but through goodwill and that we were right. And I think about that, and I think about that point where he talks about the you know the high water mark where you saw us almost achieve something, and then it rolls back. And I wonder, is that when the dystopia started at the end of the summer of peace and love, at the end of the era of the hippies and of height and all that? Is that where it started to roll back into where we're going now, what we have now? I mean, that was in itself a reaction to uh, what had been going on for a couple of decades, which was, um, you know, somebody said that uh, the, one of the earliest proto-cyberpunk novels was Gravity's Rainbow, ah. and which was set during World War II. It was really World War II that created the society that we currently live in. I mean, True. that's that's created that created the world we live in. It's, um, I mean, it's not it's not where all our borders finally solidified. That didn't really happen until well, that's still not happening. It's 100% never going to happen. 
There's the right. borders are, are as solid as you make them. Especially in Europe. Especially in Europe. <laughs> Europe and your in your uh in your Balkan states you tend to get that that goes to like Czechoslovakia used to be one country, now it's the Czech Republic and the Slo so, you know, it's two different places. Um Sub Saharan Africa. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. yeah. But so, you know, that, that utopian dream of the 60s, which was itself a chemically induced utopian dream, and uh, therefore as suspect as anything else, without getting, without getting too deep into which major intel organization was funding f the most drugs towards the most kids during the 60s, KGB or CIA, impossible to say. I mean, MKUltra and all of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Man, how much better. of it was real? How much of it was induced? That's the, that's why um, that's that's why you can never tell. Uh, you know, this puts me in mind of now that I'm rambling. This puts me in mind of the most recent season of uh, American Horror Story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't kept up. Well, it's they they shot two, I think because huh. it's like two stories in one season. They shot two, I think, because of you know pandemic restrictions. They wanted to limit the amount of space time that they had to spend with certain actors in certain roles so there's like a weird like uh, vampires in new england story in the first okay. half but the second half is all about alien abduction and alien oh. invasion and uh it it basically i haven't finished watching it yet but the the it it's it's it makes the claim in the in within the story dwight eisenhower made a deal with aliens <laughs> And it's literally Dwight Eisenhower made a deal with aliens to to get alien technology uh, in return for letting aliens abduct people. So and profile them. So that aliens <laughs> could make a alien human hybrid because they were dying on their world. And so they needed uh, to like experiment on humans. And if you change for that, we will give you all of this tech, which became all of the tech that we've kind of like blown up over the last uh, 50, 70 years. This is a, a little bit of an aside, um, and mostly inspired by some of the programming I've been watching lately. I ended up, uh, I ended up getting a subscription to Curiosity Stream because that shit's really cheap, um, and I like my documentaries. And a subject of great interest to me has been the Anthakiria mechanism, which I think you both have heard of. It's that clockwork computer they found off the coast of Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That has clockwork it's a it's clockwork technology that they thought oh well the greeks could never have come up like they there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about it being supernatural or maybe alien or whatever and all it really demonstrates is that the dark ages were very harmful to our knowledge base mm. like they weren't able to achieve that level of clockwork precision until like the swiss started making watches and okay. it's, I mean, it's still extremely well machined and precise. And they're like, oh, how could they have done this? I'm like, because they have the knowledge. And people forget the Greeks were tremendously great with knowledge and mathematics and their understanding of the natural world. Like, they, um, their understanding of physics is a lot closer to our modern. Like, they, they, they believed in the atom. Um, they understand that the world was round and they even figured out what the circumference of it was mm -hmm. you know um they figured out all this shit and they figured it out but they didn't really apply it well no they figured well, out steam right. engines but yeah. it was just an amusing they didn't it didn't occur to them to do anything with this understanding well and they were also busy trying not to be killed by each other like the whole thing with the polis with the with the city states like yeah, that was a real thing. You like, yeah, it was. and also their chief, their chief, uh, their chief um, obsession with buggery. Let's not forget that. Well, I mean, um, that's, yeah, that was the ancient world in general. But yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of that, a lot of that tech came out of the um, post Alexandrian, the Hellenistic era, which was also the era of Roman Greece, and um, like Roman concrete. She's still standing. We can't build a road that lasts five fucking years in this country. <laughs> Coliseum. It's still there. It's still, still there. there. It's still there. Um, yeah, so it was uh, – it's a case of they, they knew a lot of things. They didn't apply things as 
voraciously as we do because their society was, you know, stable. They didn't have the information technology is what I think what makes it for us, uh, how we're able to advance as we are, is our information and information recording technology um, and our ability to communicate with each other much easier. That was that developed more slowly. Um, yeah. The development of the Codex was a first century BC, first century AD tech boom, which is what enabled whatever we know about the ancient world to survive. Yes. Yes, yes um, absolutely. Because it was all scrolls before that. It was all scrolls before that or, or put down in a clay parchment. But the Codex was durable and survivable. And because they had that tech in the Imperial Age, it made it through the medieval period. And so anything, anything a monk managed to get his hands on and make, spend his life making copies of, we have. And yet, yet today we got motherfuckers believing the world is flat. I don't know. (laughs) know. That is itself a consequence of the internet though. I mean, that's, that's a YouTube induced phenomenon. Like people believe the earth is flat because you can create a sufficiently persuasive YouTube video to cast doubts on uh, how we actually know everything, whereas that looks convincing enough so that certain people will will buy it. So that is itself actually, tech-induced ignorance. Yes, but I have actually heard a different explanation, uh, and I can't remember what the video was, but the guy uh, approached the, the flat earthers in sort of a sympathetic way, and he said, here's why we have this, and people know something is wrong with the world they don't know what they don't know where to start to look for it they don't know what to grasp and this ties back in the dystopia of cyberpunk by the way sure, sure. Um, and so they're looking for an answer and for some people that answer is i'm being lied about the nature of the world i live on in some way and that is not untrue but the thing that they think in the, is the lie is stupid as fuck right right yeah. it's the low hanging fruit because when, when you start doubting what the official narrative, you replace it with something, and you can replace it with all sorts of insanity because, you know, if you make something rhetorically persuasive enough, you can get people to believe it. Oh, absolutely. And there is nothing harder to do than dissuade something, someone from something they want to believe. Like, when people tell me, well, blah, 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 and, and I'll be like, Look, I'm, what do you have to say? I mean, whatever, man. Believe what, you, what do you mean believe what I want to believe? I said, look, you believe this thing, which means your heart's set on it. You are invested in it. I have no means, regardless of what truth or evidence-based I can bring in front of you, to convince you that the reality that you believe is your reality. Like, you believe it. You don't just think it. You wholeheartedly have faith in it. And you can challenge an idea but you cannot change a belief. It's just, it's an impossibility. I've seen people swear up and down things that I know simply to not be true, but yeah. they believe it. And, you but know. You see stuff like that now with the anti-vaxxers and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I did I did want to go back to um, sort of some of the gonzo journalism thing. And I, I wanted to point out, like, I think in the early days of, of Vice, um, you know, like the Vice that news, was like that whole thing. I think it was actually very gonzo journalism. And then they were just kind of like, yeah, but like. I kind of want to have a career eventually. Like, when do I yeah. get to be a? <laughs> when do I get to be a real journalist? You know, so they, they like, got they got bought out, and now they yeah. are exactly the same as everybody else. Exactly. You you will not find anything which disrupts uh, the narrative on Vice anymore. They they have uh, they they're they're recycling horoscopes now. Yep. <laughs> they're, they're making horoscopes for Generation Z. That's what they're doing now. It's hard. Look, it is hard as fuck to be Diogenes in the modern world, you know, looking for the honest man or looking for the truth. What is truth? I mean, honestly, what the fuck is truth? That is that is an interesting question because my truth. Let's say let's say there's an event and I remember I was there and you guys were there. If you ask all three of us our memories of the event, they might line up a little bit, but you're going to get three very different stories. Sure. Are any, sure. Of, us, are any of us lying? No. 
No. Not at all. We are telling it exactly as we remember it, mm -hmm. but we're telling it from three different perspectives. These are all valid perspectives, but are any of them necessarily true? Probably not 100%. Maybe each of them contain a kernel of truth. It's, are our brains I, built to absorb and understand abstract truth is the question. Hmm. Can we even do that? Yes, but I believe in doing so. You must constantly entertain an element of doubt. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to have and skepticism. Yeah, and skepticism has to be present. Yeah, and people have a very hard time living in a constant state of doubt when they have to quit. If you got to question everything all the time, it gets tiring. And sure. you can't you can't build a community on doubt. No, no. Communities require truth. Communities require shared senses of what is. Right. So whatever, as soon as you, as soon as you you pull that apart, you're you're hitting not just an intellectual question, but a social one. You know, and, that's, and that is again also an element of cyberpunk fiction is that people believe these manufactured truths prevented them. Not because they can't see the contrary evidence, but because it is easier to live and believe the pretty lie. Well, and, and the people in positions of power are further insulated in cyberpunk stories because they, don't know the they, truth. Because they have the money. And it doesn't matter to them. The truth doesn't really matter because they no. have the power. Or they, yeah. can, they can do what they want. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it, that's the thing with, you know, like corpse, the government. Or really, just anybody that has enough money in in you know cyberpunk stories. And what is uh, truth is Pontius Pilate's question. Hmm. It is a question for philosophers. It's Pontius Pilate's question. Like, do I? What do I need to do? Truth? Eh. Do right. I want to riot? I don't. Hang that guy. Right. I wash my hands of it. I wash my hands of it. Got to yeah. say, I think David Bowie was one of the best uh, people to play. Pon I ever saw play Pontius Pilate. He did a very good job of it. What movie was that? That was The Last Temptation of Christ, which had Willem Dafoe as Jesus. I didn't see that. Um, there was a very big furor about it. I remember the, the furor. I was. Uh, I was. It's, uh, it's an in interesting like grade at the time. Yeah, I watched it, and it's actually not. At, if you watch it. Um, and you have an understanding of Christianity that actually doesn't at all uh, say anything sacrilegious in the least bit. It simply prevent, it, it presents Jesus having a moment between his crucifixion and his death of just like having a, a dream story, a dream state. Like he imagines this life that he actually never got to have while he's delirious on the cross. But it doesn't really contradict anything biblical at all. I think my sister saw it and told me she, she liked it. Um, yeah, like it, it's it's Har Harvey Keitel as Judas. It was directed by Martin Scorsese. Like it's yeah. really good, and I feel the people that protested it protested without actually seeing it or taking it into context. Because um, while I am, you know, not necessarily a Christian myself, I, I've studied the religion. And I can't see anywhere in which it contradicts any of the messages or dogmas of the Catholicism, certainly not. Well, it, just, I, I, it speculates what if Jesus had this hallucination while he was on the cross? Well, it's Cousin Zacchaeus got, uh, he got excommunicated for it. It doesn't question the message at all, as far as I can tell. Well, the Rome disagreed. I think one one vibe I picked up on that um, was something that I, I've often seen in, in certain more modern film depictions of Jesus, which is uh, Jesus not knowing he's God. Mm. He knows it in it, but he he and it's one of the elements that finds itself into the New Testament. It just he has he wants this weight taken from him. He really wants this fate taken from him right but, and that's in the gospels but the, and the, that's the part gospel. of the part of not knowing and not understanding his divinity borders on arianism and that's kind I, of that might be why the church had a problem with it i, I, I remember because i, I 
I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that impression from it, but then again, I have a different take, so. Sure. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, no, I was just going to say there they did some interesting things with how he, um, like, I thought Defoe's portrayal was, was interesting, um, just in terms of there are bits where he is kind of like, how do I know this thing that I'm telling this man about his life, having never met him before? And he's kind of like, you see him like kind of cock his head and is like, wait a minute. And it's like somebody's whispering to him and he's like, you did this and this and this and this and this. And then people are like, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> um, and like the bit where he's he goes into the desert for 40 days. Um, you know, they, they have him eat. He eats an apple and is like, eh, and just like takes a bite and is like, no, there's blood. This is bad. I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be fasting. All right, back at it. Throws it over his shoulder, goes to sleep, wakes up in the morning, and there's a tree there. And he's like, he has the like, what the fuck does this mean? Like, look on his face and is like, I wrote a book about that. Um, so did you? Yeah. I, I, it's kind of this very thing of like the whole like trying to push against the default Aryanism that I sometimes mm. see. Because um, I saw that uh, Last Days in the Desert movie with what's his name? Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, but I know what you're talking no. about. It's crap. Um, it's, uh, the actor from Train Spotting, uh, Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor, yeah, like, oh, Jesus oh, okay. and the Devil. And I was like, oh, this is a cool thing. I'll check it out. And I, I didn't like it very much at all. So I kind of like, okay, let's see if we can write a story in which Jesus is Jesus and knows who he is. And can you have a character? Because can mm. you have a character arc if you're God and you know that you're God? And so that was kind of my experiment. And uh, I published it like two or three years ago. It was called uh, The Devil Left Him. And uh, mm. it's still my favorite, uh, my mom's favorite thing that I've, I've written. Mm. <laughs> I, I, feel like, I feel like writing a story or doing a movie about Jesus, is a, you run into the same problem that you run into trying to write a Superman story. Yeah. It, it's the exact same problem. The only way a Superman story works is by focusing on his humanity. Otherwise, it's, you know, perfect beings are not interesting. Yeah, and it's really the, the struggle between um, the, that, that divine paradox of human The angel and the ape, you know? Yeah, yeah so that's kind of where I centered the story. I, I think it worked out pretty well. I, I gave the devil some really good lines. Probably. You have a, you have, you have a very good grasp of the narrative. But I gave uh, Jesus good lines, too, so it all worked out nicely. It all worked out nicely. But that's, I mean, hell, Kevin Smith did dogma, and he's, a, he's essentially a good little Catholic boy who smokes a lot of pot. But, I mean, you know, there, there, there's nothing in the Bible that says, thou shalt not get baked. Um, um, not to my knowledge. <laughs> I mean, Jesus didn't tell you not to drink. Jesus went and said, shit, we're out of wine. Hold on, bro. I got you. Give me some water. It was, it was his mom that was did, that did that. He was like, Jesus, we're out of wine. He's like, I don't care. All right, fine. All right, fine. Mom, Make the wine. mom, mom why the labor I went through, proud <laughs> my heart is break out. I was in a barn <laughs> with the donkeys and the wise men. Uh, Which of us is the child, mother? Fine, bring me the water. Here you go. All right, are your friends happy now? I'm not happy. I hope they are. Yeah, no. No, I go out. Is this a little boy? Okay, mom. Okay, I'll make the wine. No uh, more sunrise, sunset. Uh, uh, boy, tip on the roof won't be written for another two thousand years, mom. God, me. This, <laughs> this this may be as far as we've ever wandered off a topic. Like so far <laughs> off topic. This is, like, this is bonus back. content, right? That yeah. you hear that, you credible sons of bitches. Yeah, listen to the boneyard. <laughs> <laughs> How does the conversation about cyberpunk end up doing Fiddler on the Roof? I don't Look, know. This is cut content like it was run by a moil, okay? We, we, didn't, we didn't, you know, we we left out Mecha Hitler, so we're all right. We're all right. <laughs> well, now that you brought it up, man. No, I'm just kidding. Mecha Hitler or Mecha Streisand? Um, I mean, they're both terrifying, but for completely different reasons. <laughs> 
<laughs> How did we even get here? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Willem fucking Defoe? Willem Defoe. It's all Willem Defoe's fault. Um, Let's blame it on Spider Man. He was the Green Goblin. There we go. We got a bridge. All right. Let's go. Yes. Spider Man. Right. Green Goblin. Green Goblin. Um, but Cyberpunk and Dystopia. And funny enough, one of the interesting things that does show up in Cyberpunk uh, to segue back is. You get a lot of interesting interpretations of religion in uh, cyberpunk. Uh, recontextualized for the modern age, which so far in our actual dystopia that we don't, you get certainly offshoots and cults, but we really haven't seen a major recontextualization of religion in in our culture or society. Really, not. I think a lot of it is uh, in cyberpunk is very um, Nietzschean in, in some ways in as much as it's it's sort of like, well, um, the church is no longer, you know, religion, the temple is no longer the center of, of society anymore. The marketplace is. So in many ways, what you see in cyberpunk is the logical conclusion of centering you know the marketplace in many ways and it's like well what does the market do it produces winners and losers there's goods and services some people are going to come out on top and some people aren't um and of course people that do well are going to try to tilt things more so that there are other people that continue to not do as well um and that's how you get a lot of i mean it's certainly how we've ended up you know to a certain extent uh, you know, with some of the, the disparity and, you know, economic disparity today. Um, but I, I think a lot of it's very Nietzschean in terms of religion because it's like, well, this it's not the center of society anymore. It's the marketplace is. Mm-hmm. That, that's interesting. That ties into something I was listening to with Neil deGrasse Tyson about why we what, – what motivates exploration – and he said there were three things: um, war, royalty slash religion, and economic gain. And only really two of those are as active motivators for exploration in the modern times. And like royal royal decree slash religion do not tie so much into um, exploration as a motivation anymore. Well, every you know, war is a resource war. war right. Games. Yeah, that's uh, that's Starship Troopers for you. Every war yep. is a resource war, um, which means every war is an ant war, really. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, I I can't disagree. Like, it's not great to think. And about, that is but... a big feature of cyberpunk because you get all these wars. Like you have like the desert wars or the Euro wars, or there's always some kind of like. You know, resource grab like we had, you know, like we had in the 90s and the 2000s, even, you know, except we were doing it in the Middle East and, you know, say what you want to say. Oh, Saddam threatened my dad. No, oil. So, you yeah, come from, that was all, you come from all about family, oil. motherfucker. Yeah. It's about oil. It was it was it was always about oil. And um, the next the next big resource war is probably going to be over whatever we need for the next new battery technology, maybe lithium. Maybe um, now, if they were able to get, if they're able to make carbon nanotubes work out, maybe that won't be such an issue because carbon's easy to get. That's a resource you can get. A, carbon's easy. That's abundant, but it comes down to energy and re, you know, in our modern age, it's energy and resources and information, perhaps as well. But largely, it's for how can we keep the technological infrastructure going and the, you know, the the transportation infrastructure going how do we keep the road you know it's well, first we have to actually be interested in building it yeah. right well so, yeah. that's that's a questionable uh hey i just drove down a maryland road today you ain't gotta tell me <laughs> hey, maryland's maryland roads are fine go go drive in go drive in pennsylvania yeah no pennsylvania is still so much worse I yeah, have the roads in this state are okay. I'll take them. Yeah, but they used to be better. God damn it! <laughs> yeah, they did. Damn it! You yeah, sound you. like every old man right now. Because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The roads were actually better. Look, man, I rode a motorcycle through the height of my twenties, 
And it was nowhere near as hard on my ass as it is today. There might be another factor in that, you know. You shut your whore mouth. (laughs) (laughs) That's a response. Ain't the nuns beat respecting your elders and you with a ruler or not, goddammit? You're three years older than I am, dude. (laughs) It's still a number greater, damn it. AJ, nothing but a number, homie. Ain't nothing yeah. but. Yeah. <laughs> Seth R. Kelly. Ooh. I am B. How was that joke you went there, used to tell Mike? No, it wasn't my joke. It was, it, was, it was a co-worker of mine was like, yeah, so, you know, Aaliyah had that song that was like, AJ, hey, nothing but a number. And R. Kelly was like, I agree. And I was like, oh, shit, that's fired. I was like, I, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be hearing this. And he was like, no, it's true, though. And I was like, I mean, you're right. But but damn. Uh, I'm from the same minds that brought you. You ain't no snake eyes. You DJ Silky Dildo. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually a different guy. But yeah. Mm. Uh, different co-worker but yeah i don't know you get a lot of time on your hands when you work in the kitchen it's true dishwashing leaves you a lot of time to contemplate the world it's true and a lot of motivation to contemplate the world because otherwise you're focusing your mind on washing dishes it's true and the dishwasher is the off time shat upon man in the great uh service industry you don't luckily gotta worry about your tips but everyone thinks they're better than you so classism As is in cyberpunk. Well, right. And that was the other thing, which is that, you know, it's the idea of a a class-based dystopia. I mean, all societies are class-based in some degree. It's just which which society, which class is holding the, uh, is holding the reins. Right. And um, that shifts at various points in history, which, which class is holding the reins. We, we know which, Class has been holding the reins in our society for uh, a few centuries now, um, and they're they. If anything, their power is is the more cemented. Because, um, as you said, Mike, I mean, the marketplace worms its way into everything. And uh, yes, Marx said that the 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 bourgeois has has played its revolutionary role to the hilt, and is continuing to do so. I think that's the ultimate gain the ultimate message of cyberpunk is that with tech and capital allied nothing can really stand in its way it will simply run everything else over right and that's kind of where we are right now which is why it no longer feels like prophecy and no longer still feels like fiction it feels like well it does feel like prophecy but like prophecy that's coming true yeah it's, it's much closer now than you know getting closer every day kind of thing yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think that's why a lot of the a lot of stories in the genre focus on, um, for lack of a better term, it's almost like uh, human interest stories. Even if they are, even if there is a lot of action in the stories, because I think so much of it is, um, you know, the backdrop, the the environment is often just sort of portrayed as like unsalvageable. So what you end up having as a focus in the story is the is as we sort of mentioned before trying to regain or find or define or acknowledge humanity, you know, mm-hmm. humanness, um, mm-hmm. because there's not really much else. Like there's no core to society beyond the marketplace, and it becomes increasingly clear. And often in these stories, they were like, "Why are we doing this? What is it all actually for?" What does it do other than perpetuate itself? And I think what makes this particular, because anyone that's listened to us before will find that this particular subject matter has gone very differently how many of our discussions in the past have. And I think because cyberpunk is probably the most relevant subject we've discussed to date to our modern lives and experience, which is why it's rambled, because it's all interconnected uh, to our – it's less about the fiction – and more about the now and how yeah. it's real. I mean, the fiction is relevant, but doing great, a... as, you know, like doing, doing great as it is, several thousand years in the future, yes, there's, there's relatable 
things that we can recognize, but it doesn't speak to the now as much and the problems of now as much. And cyberpunk speaks to that. No. Yeah. What, whatever, when you talk about like what class could possibly take power from the class that has power now is to ask a very difficult question because it's not as though there haven't been attempts to do that, but communism turns out to be a red herring. It, it's, it's just the same thing slightly turned around. Like Marx is Hegel turned on its head. Communism is capitalism turned on its head. You know, you've got the state controlling the market instead of the market controlling the state. It doesn't matter. And from well, the worker's sadly, point of view, it makes no difference whatsoever. And anar- anarchy does not work as a system because, quite frankly, for anarchy to even succeed mildly, you have to have people of like mind of what your values are and what you should and should not do and self-control. And quite frankly, most assholes out here got to be told <laughs> not to put their fucking toothpick up their fucking nose, okay? So... You have to have shared values. And once you have shared values, you have shared community. And then once you have community, you have to enforce community values. And then you have the state. And then you yeah. have rules. Then, yeah. you, then you reconstruct it from first principles all over again. Exactly. 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 So it's not possible. So we're, it's kind of like... It's kind of like imagining that uh, Athens didn't lose the Peloponnesian War... And it just kept going. And so we're kind of in that place where they weren't overthrown and they just, the market-based empire oligarchy just perpetuated itself. And the, one of the funniest fucked up thing is the belief in American meritocracy. Like, no. Yeah. You, are not, you are not wealthy because somehow you deserve wealth or you are better than others or more intelligent or more. No, you just fluke a birth and you got, lucky. Inter- you got lucky or you fucked over a lot of people. You I know? think that's overstating matters. Cause it I does. think there is, is, there is, there is a, a good deal of, it is possible. There is some fluidity in the American class structure. That's probably the only good thing that can be said about it. Like you can, you, there is fluidity into it. There is talent from the masses can and does rise, but in order to rise, it has to become acceptable. Right. It's, it's like and, Vice Magazine. And exceptional. It, it has. It, it's like Vice Magazine. It gets bought out. Well, well yeah. Rolling Stone to go back to to Hunter S. Thompson. Well, it's yeah. I mean, and that's the whole. That was the whole thing in uh, you know a personal favorite for the three of us, like punk rock. Uh, there was a big you know, big thing with people like, Hey, are you going to sell out? And like, and it's like, who sold out and who didn't. And it's like, look at the beginning, all of these folks wanted to be pop stars, right? They were just coming at it from a different <laughs> angle. Like pretty much all of them were trying to sell out cause they were trying to make money. Yeah. Right? Well, um, do you, do you know what my motivation to be in a band when I was in was? It's very, very simple. Yeah. It we was, know what you told us. Yeah. My best friend's like, dude, women, and booze and at 21 that's all you need yeah it wasn't for the love of music or the art or none of that shit that is almost how every young male that gets into music what is on his mind it's also fun yeah it is also fun exactly it's it's more fun than going to work at mcdonald's yeah sure well i mean who wouldn't want to have a job where they're creative right yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the whole point. Yeah, you might not have any training on to be creative, but you have to create something, and that's always more fun. That's that's why we do the stuff that we do here. You know, it I is. Mean, we're interested in in being creative because that's more fun. We all have day jobs. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We all got day jobs. We all got a uh, you know we all got mortgages to pay, but we also yep. i I would rather figure out a way to write my own Lord of the Rings than watch the new Amazon series that's coming out because <sighs> yeah. and I and I don't even person... have any reason for saying that I just like they're doing a Lord of the Rings prequel 
I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, it exists. Yeah. It's called the Silmarillion, okay? And it's dull as dishwater. I um, love the Silmarillion. How dare you? <laughs> I just... I, I kind of was I was turned off immensely by the turning the Hobbit into three movies. Okay, like it did not need to be three movies. Right, and that was Peter Jackson. Yeah, best, best Hobbit representation to date. Fight me, Rankin Bass's cartoon that used to come on around the holidays. Will not argue. Wasn't bad. Yeah, no, was not bad. Will not argue. <laughs> In fact, the book that I had, or that my dad had, still has actually, that I read first read The Hobbit of was a book illustrated from the Rankin Bass animated mo- film of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was and that's that what was The good. Hobbit looked like in my mind, even though I never actually sat down and watched that. That's what it looked like in my mind. So, and you know, from my perspective of you know, I. I I have a 3D printer. I make things. Like, I'm always, you know, my wife is downstairs making a coat rack out of uh, branches she pulled from the local creek. Uh, we her make and craft things. That, yes. is, that is our thing. We are makers of things. We are builders of things. 3D printing is cyberpunk as fuck. It is. It is. We are creators. You both are creators. Yeah. You know, it's, we craft, we make. That is, that is our Reason, the uh, whatever the hell you pronounce that way, because it's French and I'm not French. But you know what I mean. thank you. <laughs> but Maybe. that's why we do this. That is what shallow and pedantic, you know, is about. <laughs> is the creative urge ultimately? Yeah. Um. Because yeah. in I think in that you know we we find some truth to reflect. Exactly. It is the truth through creation. And it's myriad of forms. Yeah. And right now, the truth we're uh, looking at is the creations of others, but that truth, which is very parallel to the reality we live in right now. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what what should you read? Hmm. What should you read? Like, let's make a list. Let's make a list of what you should read to to have a proper understanding of of cyberpunk, and and what read and possibly you. watch. Oh because, yeah, or watch. Yeah, definitely. And at um, this point, even play. Um, definitely. Um, Do androids dream of electron of, of electric but, sheep? Um, definitely. A scanner darkly. Yeah. Blade Runner. Yeah. Um. Should you read the Burroughs novel, Blade Runner? <laughs> that came out in 1979 that they they used for the movie. Never never read it, so I don't know. Um, it's kind of a, I haven't read it either. I, I looked at a synopsis of it. It's a, it's a story about a, a, a medical pandemic collapse. And, and the Blade Runners are guys who smuggle medical equipment, needles and stuff, around to where they're needed. Which is, uh, you know, some. Yeah, that stuff. sounds that sounds cyberpunk as fuck. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then they they basically bought that title to make the movie, and he's okay. even Burroughs is even acknowledged in the credits of Blade Runner. But yes, you should watch Blade Runner. You should um, probably watch and or read uh, Altered Carbon because that's pretty good uh, and a good representation, certainly, of the attitudes. Um, I think Neuromancer by Gibson is still. Yeah. Very relevant. It's also like I still think it's his best book. It yeah. is. It is. Snow Crash certainly. I think Snow Crash is still relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you should I, read Johnny Mnemonic. I think read the story. Mm, um, yeah. Which is which is found and any other any other Gibson short stories. The Burning Chrome Collection I think is really good. Yeah, I would agree. Um. Count Zero is also fun, but I don't know if it's it's essential. I've never read Mona Lisa Overdrive, but Count Zero is good. You should uh, definitely read uh, or go see Hardwired and possibly try to find the original story it was based off, which I don't know what that is. Read Transmetropolitan. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, read um, Transmetropolitan. Um, actually, uh, Akira. Akira, watch. Watch it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I Both. agree with that. 
both the manga and the uh, and the movie. They're both uh, they're and two very different movie. stories. But totally while different. it's very anime, watch Bubblegum Crisis because it is heavily influenced <laughs> by um, American cyberpunk and uh, Blade Runner itself. Like there's a band in it called Puss and the Replicants. Um, you have artificial life forms in it called Boomers. Um, <laughs> Well, that's just perfect right there. Yeah. Uh, um, you have filthy corporations. You have the Great Kanto earthquake that happened that made Tokyo fall apart and have to be recreated into Neo Tokyo. Um, definitely a Scanner Darkly. Yes. Definitely. For sure. Definitely a Scanner Darkly. Uh, the movie's also great. Yes. Those um, are choices. I would actually play the Cyberpunk 2077 video game. It has a very good storyline, and it very much gives you a feel for the world. And um, it's escapism, but it's escapism that's 20 minutes in the future. You know, like, there are still many of the same social problems. There are corporation issues. There is the high-tech lowlife. Um, Judge Dredd. Yeah, um, the uh, the Carl Urban movie is actually great, uh, but the the old, like the, the comics, especially if you can get like the first couple of story arcs, are are really uh, great. Out of two thousand eight, like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, like the Judge Dredd comics are actually uh, well and worth it. There's one that Alan Moore read wrote about a female protagonist that I cannot remember, um, that he never finished. Um, is he dead? Did he die? Alan Moore, no, he's still alive. Yeah, he's still he, just alive. Never, he just never finished it. Actually, if you want to take yeah. away, if you don't think about the techno, whether, if you think about the fact, even though it took place in the past, the attitude of Watchmen is very cyberpunk. In dystopia, yeah, dystopian in ways. Very cyber, very political, very, you know. Yeah, I mean, actually, that does kind of fit. It's, I mean, it doesn't not fit. It it might be a, a secondary or like. But V for Vendetta is better for that purpose. Yeah, maybe V for Vendetta. I don't know. They're not really well. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I could see V for Vendetta because it's definitely got more of the social aspects and the dystopian and the government control. They're both uh, definitely more so dystopian. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much. There's stuff I haven't even read that I've just heard of that just influenced what I've seen. Um, um, I will say this. I will say this. In, in, in the process of my re research, I have discovered the first novel that was called Cyberpunk. Uh, and the name of that novel is The Shockwave Rider. I heard of that. By John Brunner, originally published in 1975. Mm. It's the hero's use of computer hacking skills to escape pursuit in a dystopian future, and it coined the word worm to describe a program that propagates itself through a computer network. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. A good say. one, but it's more steampunk than cyberpunk, is The Difference Engine by Bruce Sterling and William Gibson. Mm. Okay. It imagines a Victorian London where... Babbage and Ada Lovelace were able to forward their... Babbage was able to get his difference engine to work, and Ada Lovelace was able to program it successfully to work functionally. So they have these giant steam-powered computing machines, but it's got a lot of the elements of cyberpunk in it because, duh, Bruce Sterling and William Gibson. Yeah, okay. See, now that makes the connection to steampunk that I've always wondered about. See... Uh, you can always, like, ask the question of why cyberpunk is called cyberpunk. I mean, it came out of the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, so it kind of has that dystopian, fuck-everything punk aesthetic to it. Add the cyber on it, you have cyberpunk. But steampunk is not punk at all. Steampunk. Um... It's just, like, it's it's cyberpunk, but with steam. 
<laughs> it's, it's, I mean, steam, cyberpunk can be steampunk can be described as when goths discover the color brown. Um, <laughs> or what, what did I see on on Twitter uh, the other day? Which was uh, steampunk is what happens when theater kids uh, glue stuff onto other stuff and pretend the future happened differently without there being any inconvenience. It's <laughs> it's basically historical fantasy, which is fun. Yeah, but, yeah. But most good steampunk uh, fiction I have seen has heavily dystopian elements. Uh, there's a band called Abney Park. They used to be a goth band because uh, they were named after the cemetery from Dracula. And um, then they went on to become a steampunk band. But they have a narrative. They even produced a role-playing game. But they have a narrative to their albums, which is more, more world music than anything now. But the narrative I was going to say, dystopian. what does steampunk music sound like? Very interesting from their take on it. Their fashion is more steampunk, but they tell steampunk punk, airship pirate dystopian stories of a dystopian world. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, that would not be out of tone with cyberpunk things, except technology levels are different. Mm-hmm. Good, pure uh, in my mind, really good steampunk is basically cyberpunk with a different technology level taking place in an earlier era of history but you have the same social issues and all that shit just some people like whimsy that shit up okay okay and that would probably apply to like any other of the eras defined like diesel punk yeah um diesel punk a lot more diesel punk's a lot more noir yeah Mm. because it's a lot more noir it's from the golden age of noir which is the 30s and 40s that's diesel punk and 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 cyberpunk owes a lot of its origins to noir Mm-hmm. It's very yeah, noir. Yeah. You can just call the, it updated noir. The first line from Neuromancer: "The sky was the color of a cha- of a radius of a TV station tuned to, the ch- to static, or something to that extent." That may not be the exact quote, but the sky was the color of a station tuned to static. And boy, if that doesn't just yeah give you the atmosphere. Yeah, what were you going to say, Mike? You were going to say something. Oh, um, I thought of another comic uh, that's a good read uh, by Paul Pope. It's a single volume. It's just called Heavy Liquid. Um, I've heard of that. It's it's great. Uh, it's, it's well worth it. It's a little bit... Um, it definitely is sort of cyberpunk slash science fiction. Um, but, I mean, some of the things we've talked about veer... A little bit more into into science fiction, but but have uh, cyberpunk elements. But yeah, Heavy Liquid's a good one. Oh, and okay. dare I dare I not forget two ones? Uh, one you'll be more familiar with, and the other one you may not. Uh, Apple Seed. Oh yeah. And Ghost in the Shell, both by the same creator. Ghost in the Shell is very cyberpunk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as is Apple Seed. As is Apple Seed. Apple Seed uh, has a lot of the same visual elements because the same artist and creator. Uh, it takes place in a dystopian, balkanized future. The main characters are SWAT police, mm-hmm. um, but they had been soldiers of fortune out in the wilds before they were brought back into um, society. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them is a full-body cyborg uh, named Brazarius. Okay. Um and uh, it really, Appleseed's kind of like a precursor of what Shiro would go on to do with uh, Ghost in the Shell. And Ghost in the Shell, both the comic and both uh, the first movie and some of the series are very, very cyberpunk. Yeah. Not the Scarlett Johansson movie, fuck that, but... <laughs> Love you, Scar Joe. Can't love you on that. Uh, they should have gotten the they should have gotten the actress from Pacific Rim to play uh, Makoto, but that's neither here nor there. Well, I just don't think you need to. I don't think they needed to do a live action version of no. Uh, the, the anime that particular and, story. I don't that you don't have to do a live action version. That the that. anime was so visually breathtaking anyway, and the storytelling was deep. And again, what is human? Yeah. 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 And it's yeah. uh, that's that's another f- the feature of of the, of the society where they just they don't make uh, they don't craft they just exploit existing ideas and existing stories. That's kind of what I was talking about with Lord of the Rings. Like they're just 
Amazon's just exploiting this thing that exists. And now that Christopher Tolkien is dead, I don't trust that they'll do it faithfully. No. I mean, what's it as well you shouldn't do? I mean, yeah, seriously. And that's true of like, you know, I'm not going to watch the new Game of Thrones series on HBO Max. It's no. exploitation. I'm not going to watch How I Met Your Father. I will. I will have a watch recycle, some, recycle. I will yeah. watch some Witcher. I will watch some Book of Boba Fett. But I didn't hate the new season of The Witcher because I have very low expectations of The Witcher. It's like, <laughs> Kenny Cavill's going to make uh, you know frustrated dad noises for a couple of hours, and I'm fine with that. He's going to stab some cool looking monsters, and there's this story going on. But I'm not in any way invested in it whatsoever. It's I don't care. Just like kill a monster i'll be satisfied it's like i treat it as like the pulp version of game of thrones and it's well it's wonderful when, in that respect at its best moments it really does like pull into the slavic folklore which is some dark fucked up and very disturbing shit when done right yeah um, that's, that's that's true and that's that's where we get our vampires from so we should uh we should. That's a good point to make, Karen. We should respect that. Like there is that. Um, but you are right. It's it's take these things that have worked, and then we're not making anything new. We're just gonna keep remaking the same motherfucking thing over again. And that's cyberpunk. Oh, Sad, I, but cyberpunk. I thought of yet another comic. Uh, I haven't read it in in ages, but um, it's actually uh, one that Frank Miller did called Ronin. Oh um, yeah, it, and that's a that's a great one actually, um, and it, it is, and it does actually fit really well uh, in into um, into uh, the, the, the genre. As does the Dark Knight Returns. Yeah, actually, that's true. Yeah, actually, that, in a that way, it does. The Dark in a way, Returns. Dark Knight Returns does have a very punk, cyberpunk kind of feel to it. Very, very. Since you mentioned Frank Miller, it made me think of. Um, Sin City. Sin City, yeah. Which is kind of like if if Diesel Punk had a distillation, Sin City would be it. Yeah. Like that is that pretty much without focusing too much on the technology, it's of that mindset and era. So Sin City is is probably the most diesel punk thing if you're into that. Also, Riker Howard was in that movie. He was. We're talking about the first movie, right? Yeah, yeah. just the first one, yeah. The second one was not good. No, no, no it was not. <laughs> no, my wife loved the first one. My wife actually has a great love for post-apocalyptic and cyberpunk type stories. Um, so I'm all. It's, 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 I always am on the outlook for something new to show her that's in that genre because she really enjoys it. Like I showed her Fifth of the North Star, which is entirely post-apocalyptic, but like. That shit insane. She of course oh. loves all the Mad Nick Max shit. You know what movie I haven't mentioned yet that pe- that people should absolutely be on the list? What fucking the original RoboCop? True. Yeah. A hundred percent true. RoboCop. It's a great yeah. film. Yeah. Angry that American Robot Jesus. Yeah. No. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. That's that's kind of like Verhoeven, right? Yeah, I'll buy that for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Verhoeven movie. Uh, who's a, a great satirist. Yeah, um, uh, he's great. He's fantastic. Underappreciated, I feel. Underappreciated, I feel. He is a great I think satirist, he may have been uh, attempting satire with showgirls, but I don't I don't think it, it I don't think anyone was in on the joke. I'm it, not entirely yeah. certain what the joke was. They're not all gonna be winners. <laughs> I mean, you know. He nailed it in terms of satire with Starship Troopers, though. He was like, Hey guys. So I heard you like this book. Boy, do I have a movie for you. Yeah. yeah. That, that, is, that is the greatest uh, take a dump all over the book that has ever existed. It, it, yeah, it's a contender for sure. Like, absolutely. It, it's, it beats out I'd the like, shining. The, I'd, like, I'd like to say I believe old Bob Heinlein deserved a little better than that. He did. I've read he Starship did. Troopers a lot of times, and it does not deserve the reputation that people have of it. No, it's, it's a kid's a- book. It's literally one of his junior novels. It's uh, it's 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 Sparta in space. Yeah, yeah. It's Sparta in space. Let it be Sparta in space. It's yep. fine. Yep. It's it's a meditation on on being a soldier and trying to find some ethos to fulfill that idea. Yep. You know, yep. it, it, I wouldn't universalize it, but it's it's no. fine. It's 
it's a way, it's a whole lot more interesting than um, Moon is a Harsh Mistress. I, I couldn't get through that. Oh, I got through that. Uh, yeah. I got bored. I can see that happening. You gotta got to be in a real specific mindset to get through Moon and the Heart. Man. Some of Heinlein's stuff is a really good read. Sometimes, uh... I forced my way through uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, to be perfectly honest. I was really bored for the last half of it. Oh, year. well, you see, that came about as a result of a bet between him... Uh, Ron, was that L. Ron, L. Ron Hubbard, Hubbard and yeah. Asimov? All three of them bet. They bet, hey, could we write a science fiction book and make a religion out of it? And only Hubbard could go through with actually turning it into a religion. And like, I, I think, uh, I think Asimov didn't even take a stab at, it, and Heinlein took a stab at, it and then thought better of it, and was just like. I'm going to turn this into an allegory and just do a story because I don't really want to ferment a religion. But Hubbard actually went and made a religion. You know, it's funny, Mike. You were saying that you know we haven't had uh, religion recast in 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 light of uh, in in a modern way, and I think I feel like Scientology is that thing. Oh yeah, no, you, you probably it's, it, yeah. it may be the mo- it may be the most cyberpunk religion. In the sense that it's purely cruel and purely dystopian and purely oligarchic and just just an awful thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to give us a C and D, dude? Jesus Christ. And oh, you've got money and are so happy. They don't care. <laughs> Praise them, you. God, I'm sure it's what they'd me. like you to believe. It's They're not too. listening. Yeah. It's me, too. <laughs> I never said nothing, oh, great God, Cruz. I regret nothing. No, then they're going to fucking send John Travolta to our houses and he's going to kick our asses or some shit. Or he's just going to like sneer at us and we're going to be like, oh, God, Jesus, John, go inside. Uh, but... yeah. <laughs> or, or, or ask us to work out with him or something. No, 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 I don't want to be alone with you. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to pop my head out my window and recreate the French night scene from uh, freaking Monty has I pipe on the search for the Holy Grail. <laughs> and I will fart at him a second time. Ah, yes. Yes. Um, okay. How did we get here? It's <laughs> the question we always ask at the end of these things. How did we get here? Like, I know I ramble. I know how Where's I get here. Yeah, no. I know why on YouTube to rain me in, goddammit. I blame L. Ron Hubbard. You know what? It's a safe bet. Blame L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> blame L. Ron Hubbard. Okay, Dianetics, good. Oh, yeah. Diuretics, whatever. Now, now I have a title for the podcast episode. Blame L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> Praise me, <laughs> Venue. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> How to get your podcast canceled from all of the networks. <laughs> But they don't even carry us. First, they'll carry us till they can cancel us. So there you go. We're on a lot of networks, actually. My mom called me the other day. It was like, hey, have you heard of iHeartRadio? I was like, yeah, mom. We're, we're on, on iHeartRadio? We're on oh, iHeartRadio. Oh, I got to tell the wife that. Yeah. Um, there's a reason um, There's a reason I pay for uh, the uh podcast service that we use is because it gets us on all the things well i'll be damned for it yeah we're on iHeartRadio. um we're on a bunch of things we're on itunes we're on spotify we're on all of the things um spreaker god damn it where's that where's that sweet advertising revenue Mm -hmm. Uh, dude when we get it i i promise i will bring it i will share it with you you don't have to share it with me. Just get yourself the best bottle of booze you can afford, man. I do that anyway. Oh, well, there you go. Life's too um, short to drink crappy booze. God I, damn right. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Promotion? Is it in promotion? Why why am I why am I asking you? I'm looking at it right now because I want to make sure that I'm I'm not crazy. Yeah, distribution. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Castbox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, and something called GeoSavin. I have no idea. We're on all the. Things. Don't know that one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I listen to us sometimes on Spotify. We sound really good. I, I listen. Thank I listen to us. Uh, I listen to us on uh, YouTube typically just because I have a subscribe there. 
but I've thrown people towards Spreaker as well. Um, and now knowing that we're on all of these things, I can now more readily. Uh, oh yeah, we're on all the people. things. Yeah, I usually that's, tell that's folks to. iHeartRadio is fucking sweet. Yeah, I just tell mm. folks to either do Spotify or YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so we're on all the things. That's why. It's why mm. we pay for it. We pay for the distribution. I feel like also for a bunch of storage space, which I feel like we have plenty of. Uh, unlock your plan to upgrade your plan to unlock features to help you grow even faster and get thirty percent off. I'm not going to do that, Yvonne from Spreaker. Thank you very much for your <laughs> no. message. And to be perfectly honest, we probably don't take up that much space because we have no video element to our uh, podcast. Which nobody, if I was a good illustrator, I would draw up cartoons of this shit and it would be hilarious. But dude, like, you should. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> do a, do a, a, a picture of us podcasting would be funny, especially if you did it like in a caricature type of format. <laughs> like make us look really ridiculous that would be totally worth doing i think verbally we manage that quite well hey you know it, every little bit helps every little bit helps it's true <laughs> shall we put a pin in this like, uh, yeah i think we should when All we were right. talking about defoe i almost now picture <laughs> putting the green goblin up on the cross <laughs> <laughs> Or even worse, Defoe as Schmecker in drag <laughs> from Boondock Saints. Oh, oh, oh man, that is that is that is on somebody's artwork somewhere in the world. Yeah, and somewhere. I, Rule forty two or whatever. Yeah. Well, thirty four. Rule thirty four. Thirty four. Sorry, uh, I don't know. I don't. I know. guess it's I guess it's pin time. I'm gentlemen. behind on my internetese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's time to put a pin. Uh, this has been Shallow and Pedantic's episode about cyberpunk. It was the most cyberpunk thing you've listened to all year, and you know this. My name is Andrew. I'm Mike. And I'm Kieran. Thank you all for stopping by. We'll catch you next month.